thank you for participating today. We now have coach in the chair. We will begin with questions for head coach Paul Mills. Please use the raise hand function to indicate you would like to ask a question. When you are called on for your question, please be sure to state your name and affiliation first as coach cannot see you. Our first question is gonna to go to Zach with the New York Post. Go ahead, Zach. Coach, I'm sure you've been asked this a few thousand times, but what what about Max did you see? Um, I mean, when you recruited him, I think he only had four offers. I mean, what made you want him and, and could you have ever imagined him becoming this? One, I, I heard somebody before I logged on uh, mispronounce his last name. The the B is silent. It's a uh, Ace, Acemus. Um, just trying to help you out there. Uh, one, uh, he's such a wonderful young man. Um, he wants to do everything right. I, I, I'm a big believer that good people make good players, and he is a great young man. Um, his parents. Um, are fully supportive and 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 when you have that kind of upbringing and environment you're going to gain resiliency uh, because it's not always going to go your way so when you call home and say man this is really harder than I thought they're going to be supportive and they're going to encourage you to keep pushing and so I think that's a big proponent his his ability when he was in high school, everybody knew he could shoot the ball. Um, I can recall a 430 game on a Saturday on court one where he made a pick and roll play with a with a player who is now in the Big Ten on his AAU team. And you knew that he had passing ability. And so his ability, we knew he could pass. Uh, he, to his credit, uh, he and Francis Lotzes came back to school having achieved a remarkable summer on their own um, because they weren't with us uh, on account of COVID. And when he came back, we knew he could shoot. Um, I knew he had passing ability in him. So from that perspective, it's not a surprise given what he did as a freshman. I mean, he was playing 30 plus minutes a game as a freshman for us. And, and what I didn't realize is how much he loves the moment. Um, he, he enjoys the moment. He doesn't shy away from it. And so I didn't know that. Um, and, and I've said that all year uh, when you look at our conference games, just how much he enjoys the moment. And, and so from that perspective, no. From a playing perspective, yes. But from, man, you know what? This young man thrives in these kind of situations. Uh, I would be remiss to say that I knew that. Thank you, Coach. Sorry about the mispronunciation there. We no worries. We've had a last-minute moderator change. Yeah, no worries. Not, as prepared as I not a be. problem. I appreciate it. We're going to go to Bob Holt next. Bob, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, hey, Coach. Yeah, hey, Bob. Before the Arkansas game, didn't know I'd be covering a Sweet 16 rematch. That's pretty cool. Um, you know, Arkansas has had a habit of getting behind by double digits and rallying to win. It happened in your game. It's happened in a lot of games for them, these first two NC tournament games. What do you, in, in facing them and studying them since then, um, in preparation for this game, what do you see about them that enables them to overcome these, these big deficits? Well, one, Eric does a phenomenal job. Um, he's obviously a really good basketball coach. I mean, ha having taken now two teams at Nevada and now Arkansas to a Sweet 16 is it's remarkable. And, and, and to his credit, uh, I've said this before, he does as good, if maybe not the best job of anybody in the country, of blending players from different places and bringing them together in order to play as a team. And so whatever your lead is, because they're going to continue to play as a team, uh, it's not safe, and and he knows how to change personnel. Uh, he knows how to change styles uh, in order to to get the most out of his team. And and to those kids' credit, I mean, they're obviously really talented players, and he does a great job. And those players do a great job of making sure that this fits because at the end of the day, they've won. If I can ask a quick follow, you know. Uh, 
Max scored 11 in the game here in Fayetteville, which, you know, that's pretty good. But by his standards, you know, he usually scores a lot more. I know he got an early foul trouble. Maybe that impacted him. What do you remember about that game and what Arkansas did to, you know, contain him, you know, more, more than most teams have been able to do? Yeah, we're a much different team than, than we were earlier this year simply because Max is way more ball dominant um, than he was previously. Uh, once our third leading scorer went down, um, Max was, we told Max that he would have to be more assertive. Uh, we, we had to figure out where these other 11 shots were coming from. And so we're, we're a different team in just how we handle everything. Um, and, and then we would play two point guards and so we can move Max on the ball, off the ball. We still have that capability with Carlos, but uh, I, I would tell you that we're way more ball dominant with Max than, than we were way back in December. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Morgan Beard next. Morgan, go ahead and unmute. Hey coach, what's going on? What's up, Morgan? Hey, nothing much. So uh, another talking point with the tournament, you know, is the conference and of course, you know, the Big Ten and all that's getting a lot of attention, but it seemed like a lot of people were surprised to see that you guys were fourth uh, the fourth seed in your own conference tournament, and now you're making this remarkable run. Is that more of a testament to the quality of play and, and, and what the Summer League has to offer and or just the type of gear you guys have switched into the last month or so? One, um, I'd encourage people who don't know much about the Summit League, go back and look at the last decade. The league is number one in three-point field goal percentage, number one in two-point field goal percentage, number one in free throw percentage, number one in offensive efficiency, and number one in effective field goal percentage out of the 32 conferences. It's a really skilled basketball league. And, and so simply because other people don't know that, um, when you compare all 32 conferences in those five categories um, is what it is. I mean, uh, I, I understand it. People pay a lot more attention to the Big 12s and the Big 10s. So from that standpoint, I'm not surprised. Uh, from our vantage point of fourth, obviously, we didn't get to play all of our games. Had we been able to play and obviously win the game that we missed on account of COVID, we would have finished second in our conference. So, I mean, th this is a hard year to try to gauge uh, just how the rankings fell in your individual conference. But I, I, would, I would say all of that to say, where we ranked in our conference, it's a testament to everybody in our conference. Um, and, and go look at the history of it. Uh, it's pretty good. Thank you, Coach. Appreciate it. Next, we'll go to Pat Forty. All right. Hey, Coach. Uh, hey, congratulations. Hey Pat. Pat Thank you. From Sports Illustrated. Uh, following up, actually, on the same subject, I, I watched the semifinal game against South Dakota State and the final game against North Dakota State. They were both really exciting, tense games down to the wire. Uh, what did you, what do you recall from those games? What did you see from your team to be able to pull those games out and maybe that's carried over to, to this stage? Yeah, it, you know, we talk about this a lot at our place is you have to win within. Uh, winning starts on the inside of you before it ever gets exhibited externally. So to give you the silly analogy that I often use, is a ball when it hits the ground is going to bounce back up because it has air in it. Hopefully our players have a lot more than air in them. And so you have to have some level of resiliency because winning is going to start on the inside before it ever gets exhibited externally. So something, I, my prayer is that our guys have something on the inside of them and, and they do. They have a core to them. Now, but here, here's what I would tell you, and, and your personal issues, um, you kind of develop a grit and a toughness about you. We've had a couple of players who had to deal with situations with parents on account of COVID in ICU and didn't know if they would live. Um, we've had several of our players whose parents have been displaced um, home-wise on account of COVID. And, and had to find financial strains and had to find new places in, in order to live. I would tell you that as difficult as those situations are, and they were heart-wrenching when we were going through them as a team, those kind of things, not only do they develop 
a resiliency, but basketball almost becomes therapy. Um, if you've ever played basketball, in my opinion, one of the great joys about it is being in a gym by yourself and just shooting a basketball and thinking through things and putting dreams in your head. And because of COVID, you weren't allowed to be around people. And, and, and I think that basketball was almost therapeutic uh, for so many of our players as they battled through difficult situations. And it was our job as coaches to be there, to be sensitive to their issues and, and kind of walk with them through this stuff. But I would tell you, when I go back and look at those games, what I saw was a team that loved each other. I mean, I tell our guys this often, it's, it's our job as coaches to love you. It's your job as players to love each other. And I, and I would tell you that that level of love and resiliency was what I saw exhibited over the course of um, the, the entire year, but it, it obviously was on display in both of those games. Do you think the, uh, that, the, that resiliency then carried over to, to doing what you've done in this tournament? Well, I mean, you expect to win. I mean, so I, I, I really don't know how to answer that. I mean, the expectation is that you come in, you're prepared, and, and that you do the things necessary in order to win a, win a game. Did the resiliency continue? Yes. Uh, did their love for one another continue? Yes. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Cameron Jordan with the Oklahoman. Hey, Coach. Cameron Jordan with the Oklahoman here. Um, hey, Cameron. I know you've seen the, the fan reaction and the campus reaction from back at home of, of your guys' first two wins. What has that been like for you guys to see the reaction of not only people on campus, but also just the community around Tulsa as well? Mm, no social distancing uh, in this day and age, uh, which is – somewhat cool because here's what I think it expresses is you temporarily like lose your mind uh, when you are ecstatic and enthusiastic about something. And so I, I've done that. Uh, I've had to call Chris Holtman. I've had to call Michael White uh, after we won our games and apologize that I didn't go over and shake their hand and acknowledge them afterwards because you temporarily – are exuberant and you're excited. And so what I saw there was, hey, we know all of the things we have to do in order to protect one another. Uh, but momentarily, those things get lost because of, a, of an enthusiasm. And so to be a part of, of adding to people's enthusiasm uh, for our players, it, it's pretty cool. Thank you, Coach. We have time for a few more. Let's go to uh, Billy, please. Hi, Paul. This, hey, is, this is Billy Witz with the New York Times. Um, I had a, a couple of them, but uh, you know, when it, it looks, I would imagine you've had to turn over a lot of rocks to uh, just put this roster together and just find. Uh, I mean, there's so many guys from so many different backgrounds and, and places. And I'm wondering how, when you introduce yourself or your coaches do, how much do they know about Oral Roberts? One, it's not as difficult as you're making it sound. Um, we have six, we have four Europeans, and then we have a person from Haiti, uh, Jonathan, and then we have a young man from Canada. So, so, so we have um, six guys uh, from who are not American, and then we have. Five Texans. Um, I, 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 I say, uh, so Texas, Europe, um, it's kind of our combination. Um, so that's kind of what we do. Um, so you try to identify. People in Europe know nothing about ORU. Um, they just know basketball. Uh, the people from Texas do know something about ORU. But more importantly, they know the people, right? There's nothing magical about a, a, a name. Um, you want to know, from a parent perspective, is your child going to be in a safe environment? You want to know, as a basketball player, do the coaches have a track record of actually doing what they say they're going to do? And I would tell you from both of those standpoints, 
Um, ORU checks both of those boxes. And, and I'm not bragging on me. I'm just telling you that the staff I have is really, really good. Um, and so because of that, we check both of those boxes. And so it's not that difficult, in my opinion. And, and, and also, just looking at your schedule, um, you played a lot of teams that are in the tournament. How much has that helped you these last uh, two games and also in your conference tournament? No, we've either played the third or fourth toughest non-conference schedule in the country per Kim Pomeroy, depending upon what day you look at it. All five teams that we played in the non-conference made the NCAA tournament. Um, you lose by five to Oklahoma State. You lose by five at Wichita State. Uh, you're up 12 on Arkansas in the second half, and you squander a lead. And so we knew when you go back and you watch this film, here are the possessions that need to get cleaned up in order to be on the right side of these games. So um, those things prepared us well uh, for what we're currently experiencing. And, and then our conference did a great job of also preparing us. Thank you. Thank you. We'll squeeze in one more. We have TJ Eckert from KTUL. Go ahead, TJ. Coach, I've had a lot of people ask, and I'm curious to hear it as well. You guys are spending your time in the bubble since you're there much longer than the rest of these teams. You guys are, you got a week to practice now for this game. I mean, how are you guys spending your time other than being on the floor? Obviously? One, they have class um, in, in, in this COVID situation. Obviously, a lot of people do class virtually. So they have school responsibilities. Um, they have homework responsibilities. They have test responsibilities. I've, I've always thought that basketball players and, and any student athlete, um, you're going to school full time and at 2, 3, 3.30, whenever class is over, um, you're not going to be a typical student and be able to go back to your dorm room and, you know, do whatever. Um, you're coming to practice and the coaches have been sitting around all day waiting for practice and we wear you out uh, with weights and then with basketball practice now you're tired and then you have to go back and then you have to do the tutoring and you have to do the homework um, because you had a four or five hour period uh, in which you were involved in whatever athletic sports you were so I would tell you that that's not much different now uh, obviously we're not on the floor as much um, our time is limited but they have class uh, they have responsibilities and coaches, you're just pouring yourself into the film and what's next. So, I mean, we've all been very busy and, and I'm glad we don't have to travel because that makes the fatigue that much worse, but um, it's probably not much different than they would be doing it if we had to travel back home and prepare. Gotcha. Thanks, Coach. All right, thank you, Coach, for your thank time you. today. We really appreciate yep. it. Uh, we will be joined shortly by Max. Please use this time to raise or lower your hand as necessary. Thank you. Hi, Max. Thanks for joining us today. Apologies for messing up your last name earlier. I regret that. Um, but we will go ahead and get started with your interview. Um, again, I will remind the media members to use your raise hand function to indicate you would like to ask a question. And when you are called on, please state your name and affiliation first before asking your question. Let's go to Sam uh, with the Dallas Morning News, I believe. Yeah, that's right, Sam. Well, with the Dallas Morning News, you know, I Curious to go back to your recruitment a little bit. I'm sure you've been asked about this a few times this week, but you know, what's it? What What do you kind of recall about that time? And you know, not getting the offers maybe that you had thought you would. I know a lot of coaches saw you, AAU coaches, uh, or excuse me, college coaches at the AAU level. Just kind of take me through that process and your perspective. Yeah. So uh, coming out of high school, um, I had offers from the three military academies: Army, Navy, Air Force, and then Oral Roberts and Marist. And so, like you said, I, I wasn't didn't have a lot of recruits um, really offer me like that. Um, I was talking to a lot of them, but uh, none of them really offered like that. But um, Coach Springman um, and, his, and uh, the staff here, they just fell in love with me from day one, and they showed a lot of love. And 
Uh, they really wanted me to come in and have an impact on uh, ORU basketball. And so that's what I wanted to do at the end of the day, um, pick the best fit for me and um, have an impact on the program. And I was talking with Russell a little bit, and he mentioned, you know, just the past year, the difference between last year and this year is you, you're, you have the ball in your hands a lot more. I mean, are you kind of, I mean, how would you kind of describe the way that your role has changed over this last year? Yeah, I mean, last year for me, um, I played a lot off the ball. Um, I didn't really play on the ball that much. Um, it was a lot of guys creating shots for me. Um, and so coming into this year, um, just losing a lot of seniors um, and a lot of guys, I knew I would take a, a bigger role. And so um, this year is a little bit, is a lot more of me being on the ball, uh, kind of creating my own shot, um, creating my own, uh, creating looks for my teammates and really just getting the offense going. And so um, that was one of the big roles I wanted to take this year, um, was just kind of being a, a bigger leader out there, just being that we lost a lot of guys last year. Thank you, man. All right, next we'll go to Lucas Weiss with the undefeated. Lucas, go ahead. Hey, Max, Lucas Weiss with the undefeated. Um, coach was just in and he was just talking about the resiliency that you guys have had to, to overcome this year. I'm, I'm just curious about how those moments allowed you guys to just strengthen your connections with your fellow players and coaches and how that's allowed you guys to, to thrive in this tournament. Yeah, I mean, just all the guys, I mean, we all work hard. Uh, we all fight through everything. And so I think when, when everybody kind of has that same mentality of not letting anything stop us and just being a resilient group of guys, I think that definitely builds uh, chemistry between all of us. And at the end of the day, we all want to win. And so um, we want to go out there and do whatever we can to help the team win. And so um, through the ups and downs of the game, we're just, we're just a team that's going to be resilient and fight through all that. All right, next we'll go to Kelly Hines with the Tulsa World. Kelly? Max, when you look back at the film of that Arkansas game, um, I know that seems like a lifetime ago in December, but how much growth do you see in, in the team since then? Yeah, I think we've had a lot of growth, um, just um, playing conference, um, playing back-to-backs. Um, I think we stepped it up a lot uh, defensively. Um, even going back to conference tournament, um, we knew we had to be playing our best basketball um, going into that and then uh, carrying that momentum over to the NCAA tournament. So I think we've improved a whole lot um, defensively. And then um, just over time, I mean, the chemistry just grown and uh, became even stronger. So I think we're a much better team. Thank you. Next, let's go to uh, Robbie Fueling. Hopefully I pronounced that right. Go ahead, Robbie. Hey, Max, I, I talked to your high school coach yesterday. Chris told me that you took some deep threes in a couple high school games, and he said that, hey, if you're going to take that deep shot, you, you ought to practice it. And on the broadcast, when I was watching over the weekend, they were calling you midcourt Max. Have you always had that range? Kind of talk about your game. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, midcourt Max was kind of one of the uh, nicknames that kind of went over Twitter and kind of stuck. But, I mean, yeah, just working on um, shooting deeper threes, um, I kind of have had a reputation of being a shooter. So, I mean, a lot of teams won't let me get, um, like, open looks, um, probably right on the line, toe on the line. And so, I mean, I just added to my game, shooting a little deeper, kind of stretching the floor a little bit more. And so um, just taking what the defense gives me at the end of the day, not forcing anything, and just playing my game within the offense. Awesome. And, and last question for you. Coach Hill also said you, you're, you're on the quieter side. He said one of the teachers um, back at Jesuit didn't hear you talk until you did an interview in, in high school. How, how would you describe yourself as a player? Are you a silent killer, do you think? Uh, I, I guess you could say that, um, you know, but I mean, coming into this year, uh, just taking on a bigger role, um, I knew that I would have to be more vocal, um, being a leader too. And so that's kind of just one of the things I, um, I've gotten better at this year, uh, just being more vocal to the guys, just encouraging them, and uh, just taking that next step on uh, overall. Appreciate it, Max. Thank you. Good luck this week. Thank you. Next, we'll go with Nikki, uh, Nikki Chavanel. Hopefully I got that one right. Go ahead, Nikki. Hey, Max. Nikki Chavanel from Hogbeat. Uh, Devo Davis and Jalen Williams, two freshmen. One of them didn't even play last time you guys played Arkansas. What have you seen from those two on the tape of all these Arkansas games since then? Uh, well, we haven't gotten to watch a lot of film, um, the players, but uh, we know the coaches, they've watched a lot of film, um, and they're going to put together a good game plan, um, give us a scouting report and everything. And so we just, we, we know how much work that they put in. So um, we'll just look at what they say and um, execute the game plan. 
Thank you. Let's go to Scotty Bordellin. Scotty, go ahead. Hey, Max. Scotty Bordellin with WholeHogSports.com in Arkansas. Uh, a couple of the Arkansas players this week have mentioned, you know, really gearing up for you guys as two-man game, you know, with you and Kevin. Um, could you detail maybe how that's developed throughout the season, or, or was it there from the beginning? Uh, yeah, I mean, throughout the season, um, I think a lot of the attention has been on uh, me and Kevin. But I mean, um, I think I think that um, the other guys in the locker room don't get a lot of credit too, uh, especially the way we've been playing lately. Just everybody in the locker room has uh, contributed to us winning, and so um, a lot of attention goes to me and Kev. But it, I mean, it's everybody in the locker room. Everybody's impacting winning um, from one from the first player on the roster to the fifteenth, all the way to the coaching staff. So um, it, it's a team effort. It's not just a two-man game. It's more to it than um, than all the attention has been. Thank you. Next, let's go to Nathan Thompson. Nathan, go ahead. Hey, Max. Nathan Thompson at Fox 23 in Tulsa. Uh, the first week of the, the tournament, you guys were really down playing that underdog role. Now you guys are the biggest Cinderella in a, in a tournament that really romanticizes Cinderella teams. You got a lot of attention nationally. Are you embracing that Cinderella role, or are you down playing that? I mean, coming into it, I guess um, we, we embraced it in a sense. But I mean, for us coming in, uh, we're confident in ourselves. Uh, we know the work that we've put in all season, um, from the off season all the way up to this point. And so um, just having a guy, a group of guys that just work hard, um, it ultimately builds confidence in all of us. So everybody's surprised by us winning. But I mean, we didn't come here just to be here. I mean, we came here to win games. And so we go into every game um, confident just because we know the work that we've put in all season. And being only the second ever 15 seed to make the Sweet 16 has gotten you guys a lot of attention nationally. I mean, what's it been like? How crazy has it been, the attention you've gotten because of it? Yeah, it's been real crazy. Um, just a lot of outside noise, um, congratulating everybody. I mean, it's a whole lot of outside noise that you can get caught up into. But for us in the locker room, it's easy. Um, it's easy for us to get distracted in that, but it's important that we just block all that out. Um, just continue to focus on those 15 guys in the locker room and um, trying to win uh, more basketball games. Thanks, Max. Thank you. We'll do a couple more. Next, let's go to uh, Chris DiMaria. Chris, please go ahead. Hey, Max. It's Chris from Channel 2 back home in Tulsa. Uh, man, when you talk to a lot of guys at this point, uh, they think about a hoop they used to play on, whether it be in their driveway or their, uh, or their local park or something. Uh, moments when, when they pictured themselves playing in this moment. Uh, is there any hoop or any moment that you think back to when you were a kid that you're like, man, I, if only I could tell that kid that I made it? I mean, yeah. I mean, as a kid, it's just being in the NCAA tournament, um, having an opportunity to compete against the top teams in the country, that's, that's always one of your dreams. And so um, for me as a kid, um, definitely dreamed of that. Um, and I mean, that's what all the hard work, um, it pays off to. Um, it's great to see the hard work paying off um, to this point. And so it's just one of those things that I'll uh, be able to remember for the rest of my life. And Max, I was talking with some of the guys in the 1974 ORU team. And they, they talk about, they, they feel brotherhood, a camaraderie with you guys now because you're doing what they were doing back in 1974. What does it mean to you uh, to be setting that history and to be, uh, and to be kind of redoing the history uh, rewriting the history here at ORU for, for years to come. Yeah, it means a lot for us, um, for all the guys in the locker room. I mean, coming into a program, you always want to impact it. Um, you want to leave it better when you leave. And so um, for us to be able to put ORU back on the map is definitely um, something that we're all grateful for. Because um, we know at the end of the day, it's bigger than us. It's not just about those guys playing right now, but it's about everybody who's came through ORU, all the alumni. And so we just want to represent ORU to the best of our abilities. Thank you, Max. Good luck this weekend. Thank you. Next up, we'll go to Pat Forty. Pat, please go ahead. Hi, Max. Pat Forty from Sports Illustrated. Congratulations. Just wanted to ask you about the uh, you know the very close games you guys had in the Summit League tournament. If you can recall what you were thinking the the end of the semifinal when you won on on Kevin's tip, and then the, the going down to the wire from North Dakota State as well. I mean, yeah. I mean, at this time in March. Every game is going to be, you know, usually games are one or two possessions. So every possession matters. I mean, coming into March, we already know that all the games are going to be close. It's, it's rare that there are a whole lot of blowouts. So it's important that we uh, cherish each possession um, and not take, uh, not take a possession off because at the end of the day, it can come down to one possession. 
from that standpoint, you look back and think, wow, I mean, if, if Kevin doesn't tip that ball in, maybe we're not here? I mean, maybe, but I mean, if we, we go to overtime that game, I have the most confidence uh, that we would have been able to pull it out. Um, just being a resilient group of guys, um, I, I had confidence we would pull it out. Thank you. All right, we'll take one more. Let's go back to Kelly Hines at the Tulsa World. Go ahead, Kelly. Max, I just wanted to ask you about um, Kevin and um, in particular how he can make uh, those big plays late in games. Um, what is it um, about him that um, allows him to do that? Yeah, I mean, players make plays. Um, and so for Kevin, um, I know he's a, he's a great player. Um, I know how much work he puts in. Um, that's, that's really for everybody, but I know Kev puts in a whole lot of work. And so when the lights come on, uh, he's always going to shine. And so um, that, I always have the confidence in him uh, to knock down big shots, uh, make the big play. And I mean, I think that's just a, a confidence that we have in uh, everybody on the team. All right, that'll do it for today. Thank you, Max. We really appreciate taking the time to join us today. And for everybody else, you can find a recording of this press conference in the NCAA Digital Media Hub soon. It will be posted at www.ncaa.veritone.com. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Appreciate you guys.